Yeah, welcome to Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel here on a given specially wet and power failure Tuesday here in Honolulu. Um, and we are, we are talking with Aaron Solomon. He's with Esquire Digital, um, and he's a lawyer, and he's um, what, legal analyst, legal analyst manager in Montreal for Esquire Digital. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Really happy to have a chat today. Very, very exciting. I, I didn't realize that Esquire had, that, had gone so far as to become digital. And um, I guess, I guess uh, it, it's the Esquire that um, uh, is to appeal to the entrepreneurs and the startups. Am I right? Well, actually, what we do at Esquire Digital is we, we basically help lawyers grow their businesses. Uh, but I comment around the world on really important issues where the law intersects with other things in our society. Great. Important especially now. And I guess my first question is, you know, if you're following startups and you're following entrepreneurial activities and development of new products of every kind and nature everywhere, um, how has the world changed in COVID? How is the world changing now? You know, everything else is changing. So this must be changing too. You know, so it's a great question. And I've really been surprised since 2020, as I was telling you before we started our broadcast, I was living in Berlin for a few years. And in Berlin, I was actually the head of growth with one of the big startup accelerators uh, in Europe. And I really was surprised from what I've seen since the beginning of COVID because I'm very surprised to see so much money out there chasing really early stage startups. Uh, it, it's really surprising. It's almost like COVID began and all this venture money. And listen, we all know the venture capital model, right? You've got to hit that grand slam. And it's really no big deal if when you do so, you get a fair amount of strikeouts. So everybody's chasing after that grand slam with, in some ways, I think, just silly money that's out there. So that's been surprising to me since, let's say, early 2020. You know, uh, I also wanted to ask you, I know it's a digression, but I I asked you about the quality of entrepreneurship, the quality of especially, uh, uh, you know, computer software entrepreneurship in Germany. You know, I've always been impressed with um, how good they are and how much they come up with and how they work as teams and so forth. And, and I am thinking, by the way, of a movie I saw recently called The Billion Dollar Code. And it's the story of how Google uh, stole, I mean, arguably, allegedly stole uh, Google Earth from a, a group of uh, German programmers in Berlin. Um, and it portrayed, uh, you know, the way they work together. It also portrayed the, the way the American court system, legal system worked in order to favor Google when they sued him in Delaware, which was the, um, you know, uh, state of incorporation for Google. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts about the, you know, the creativity um, the quality of their entrepreneurial uh, work. In so I've got, to, I've got to answer this question by drawing a delineation. So I think that there's a big delineation between technical ability of developers and entrepreneurial culture. So I'll answer the first part of the question first, in which I totally agree with you. The quality of the developers who can, you know, even founders who come from a tech background in places like Berlin, uh, again, it's hard to say Germany as a whole, because even though it's a physically small country, there's so many people. But in a startup hub like Berlin, the tech quality is very high. It's also made even higher by the fact that Ger Berlin is one hour from the Polish border. And as we know, in Eastern Europe and some of the former Soviet republics, the you know, inexpensive developer quality is fantastic. Then the second part of my answer is the entrepreneurial culture in Germany, which is just horrible. Even in somewhere like Berlin, Germany as a whole is 20 years behind Silicon Valley when it comes to entrepreneurial culture. On my better days in Germany, I'd like to think that they were 10 years behind. And then the next day I'd have a bad day and I'd say it was 30 years. But let's <laughs> average it out to the fact that they're right around the turn of the century when it comes to the notion of entrepreneurial culture. The idea of like, hey, kids, let's go do a startup. It's nowhere like it is in North America. <laughs> you know, that's apparent in the movie. You know, they were they were brilliant in the way they set it up. They invented it. Um, yeah. But then when they got into trying to make it work, commercialize it, that was, that was where it got stuck. And they lost it. 
<laughs> yeah, I believe it. <laughs> I could tell some great, uh, some great Berlin stories, but yeah, we'll move on nonetheless. Yeah, let's move on to uh, MVP and IVP, yeah. okay? And this is, um, you know, maybe central in the whole notion of, um, of finding the way to present your product to, I, say, I guess, capital concentrations and to the public um, in, uh, on the continuum of, of putting it out there, commercializing it, making, making it successful. So first, let's talk about the classical MVP. What is that? Um, and uh, how, how, how does that play in the continuum? Uh, I'll answer that, but let me just say just a little touch about my background first. So the, what, what kind of got me thinking a lot about MVPs and IVPs was the fact that I've been an entrepreneur, had my own startups, but also worked with a lot of entrepreneurs over the past 25 years. I was actually one of Peter Thiel's first mentors for the Thiel Fellowship in San Francisco. I designed and taught an entrepreneurship course in education technology at the University of Pennsylvania. And most recently, I taught a practical entrepreneurship course based on Alex Osterwalder's business model uh, at McGill University. So a lot of what I've been thinking about with the MVP and IVP is actually in influenced by the ideas of my students. So what we teach students is, you know, the idea of an MVP is your minimum viable product. Just put together a minimum viable product and you can go raise money and you can take it to market. The problem is MVPs are subjective, right? What might be minimum to you might not yet be minimum or minimal, depending on how you define it. To me, there isn't like one practical working definition for every entrepreneur to understand whether their product is sufficiently built out, sufficiently advanced to take it to market. So the MVP is the first thing you would consider taking to market. Can we make a case study here? Yeah. Um, can we, you know, let's, let's pick a product. And you well, can I'm, help me flesh it out. I'll pick a great one because it's in the news all the time. And I actually do a lot of legal commenting on NBC for this. It's the Elizabeth Holmes trial. And of course, she was the founder and CEO of a company called Theranos. For those who don't remember Theranos, they had this technology that was going to revolutionize how we drew blood. Instead of you know putting the needle in your arm and drawing a lot of blood, it was going to be a finger prick and take a little, little bit. So she invented this black box called Edison. And her MVP, one would think, would be a functional black box that probably didn't look great, but essentially took that little, little bit of blood and was able to do the tests and the analysis that you wanted to do. However, her MVP didn't work. <laughs> so that's a good definition of an MVP that was not yet M. It was pre-minimal. So I think oh. that that's a good one that we could talk about is the Theranos box that analyzed their blood. Okay. Uh, and, uh, by the way, just uh, my reaction is if it didn't work and she was going out in public and showing her MVP that didn't work, she was shooting herself in the foot. Um, and that was a burden to carry for the rest of the, the project. No, I mean, this is, this is really bad to have that happen. Isn't it? It is really bad, which is why she may spend up to 20 years in prison. Um, but even though it was really bad, you know, this 18-year-old Stanford dropout managed to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. And trust me, Jay, I've seen people talk to me about their ideas and their MVPs. And I was thinking, I'm, I'm more wrong than right when it comes to startups. I was thinking there's no way these guys are ever going to raise any money. And six months later, they're sending me a note. They raised the $5 million round. So, you know, sometimes what do I know? Well, who's the audience on this sort of thing? So now you have an MVP, you're, you're presenting it as an MVP, um, and you know, you're, 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 you're doing a pitch to somebody. Uh, yeah, who, probably, is, who is that person? So it's people who are involved in the game of risk capital. Now, we don't necessarily need to you know, talk about all the stages of fundraising, but really your first round that you should always raise would be friends and family. That said, Friends and family round is also risk capital. If you're going to your Uncle Moses and you say, hey, listen, Mo, you know, how do you feel about giving me $10,000 for this business? He's expecting a return, even though he may not be an accredited investor, even though he may be an amateur. You know, Uncle Moses is thinking that he's going to give you 10 grand and he's going to end up with a million one day. So no matter who gives you money and no matter how early, it is risk capital. And it's often money that people or even institutions can't afford to lose. But 
if you already have some money of your own, then maybe your MVP is for your seed round where you're going to try to raise, I don't know, 50, 70, 100, $500,000 to get that product past the MVP stage. Uh, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that the uncle part of it is secondary <laughs> to the making a return part of it. <laughs> I would think so, especially when it comes to the next family picnic and he's stalking you and you're running away from him. Like, I have nothing to tell you at the moment. So, okay. So uh, talking, you're talking to somebody who has some capital and you're talking an MVP, what in the black box condition, I mean, the black box uh, scenario, um, I mean, the black box that takes blood, that black yep. box. Um, what are you saying? What are you saying to this person? What's, what's the, what's the pitch at the MVP level. So at the, what it should be at the MVP level is, okay, listen, we built this thing. It's going to be this device called Edison, and it's going to be a black box. But right now, honestly, the box itself is kind of fake. What I want to show you today is the fact that we can take a far less bit of blood than you would usually take in a blood test. And I want to show you the tests that can be performed on this bit of blood. So what you're doing is you're proving that you've got at least a minimally viable technology that's going to do some of the things that you say it does. So then as an investor, I'm going to say, well, okay, this is cool. So it shows, it can show, for example, blood sugar. What can your box do in the future? So now we're going to talk about the stages that go beyond MVP. And that's the point where you tell an investor, well, it's going to do these 19 other different tests that has never been done with this little bit of blood. And you're going to say, well, can it do it right now? No, no, no. All it can do right now at the MVP stage is test blood sugar. Okay, that's good to know. But it does that, right? Yes, it does that. Well, that, that would encourage me as an investor, okay? Yep. At least we have that. At least we have that. <clears throat> and if we have that, then it's a matter of just copying the approach, copying the research, copying the whole technique, and maybe doing other functionality as well. Yes. Okay, so now, now I change the scenario on you, and I ask you to pitch. Um, we, maybe we should define this first. Pitch for an IVP. That's different. Initial, uh, what, initial... Uh, what's the term? Viable product. Viable product. Uh, yeah, so, so how does that differ? So I thought up this term IVP, again, through a lot of work with my students and a lot of startups that I've seen. And, you know, kind of along this startup continuum, I really see an IVP as an MVP where you've had an opportunity to get feedback on it, measure what the MVP does, and continue to iterate. So if you want to think of an MVP as a technology that's half-baked, let's say your IVP is, you know, three quarters or five-sixths baked. So if we want to stick to the black box idea, now you've got something that is more saleable. A lot more people, a lot like pharmacies like Walgreens or CVS are going to want to work with your box. It does a lot more tests than it did in the MVP. The box probably looks more functional and Walgreens can imagine having it in their stores and it sees the size of it. It's not just like, you know, a box that you put together to house your technical things on the inside. It's not done yet. Because, you know, especially when it comes to hardware, in our example, hardware may never be done. I say this as somebody who owns, actually, I own a watch company. I have a watch startup that we did in 2017, and we're on our fourth watch model right now. We're always thinking about different things that we want to build, different technologies within it. So we're never going to be able to say we're done, nor was Theranos, in our example, ever going to be able to say they're done. But the IVP is further along the continuum from idea to finished product than the MVP is. So, you know, the choice of those terms confuses me. Um, I would see, let's see, I would say initial comes before minimal, um, but you're saying that minimal comes before initial. Right, because, because minimal is like, generally what you see in an MVP is not, if you want to call it a whole viable product, it's like a piece of something that it can do. And what I think of when I think of an IVP is an initial, initial truly viable product. So maybe I should have put IT. If I think of the MVP as something that's often, come on. The reality is as startups rush to this starting line, they're putting together often MVPs that just aren't workable. What I'm saying with an IVP is it's your initial really viable product. It's, it's, so it's, an, it, it's an initial of the final. Yeah, it's an, you, exactly. You can see the outline of the final. 
Right. Because often what happens in an MVP is investors get approached and they ask a lot of questions. They understand that the MVP doesn't do anything near what they needed to do. And then they say, okay, well, I guess come back to me in six months when you have like a real MVP. What they're actually saying is come back to me in six months when you have an IVP. What about uh, come back to me in six months when you got some patent protection? Yeah, or come back to me in six months when you have a revenue. See, here's the thing. Like, <laughs> there's always excuses for investors who don't want to invest. There always will be. And it's frustrating for startup founders, especially first-time startup founders, who say, I'm hearing I need to show X. I show X, they tell me I need to show Y. I show Y, they tell me I need to show Z. And it goes on and on and on and on. But again, the people who have the money create the rules of the game. Sure, they do. And, and there's so many, there's 57 ways to leave your lover. You can just keep thinking, <laughs> keep thinking of these things. Well, you know, um, God, you know, this whole conversation sounds like Shark Tank. Have you, have you, <laughs> you make a comparison with the, this kind of crucible with Shark Tank? Well, I mean, sometimes it is. Like, I've been on both ends. I've been on the investor end. I've been on the venture partner end of people pitching to me. I actually did a fair amount of work and helped set up an accelerator in Beijing for a large Chinese investment fund. So I had a lot of companies come to us trying to get funding and trying to get their support and entry into the Chinese market. I've also been a startup founder. So I've been on the, I'd like some risk capital end of things. And sometimes it's kind of artificially shark tankish. Sometimes the, you're, you're in a very serious room with very serious investors, and it feels a little bit shark tankish, but the best investors know how to kind of de-stress and de-escalate the situation and have a really honest, open conversation with founders. One of the things that founders get put in the position of, and I don't think it's their fault, is when investors want to know about revenue. You know, somebody's got an MVP. The thing isn't even done yet. And they're saying, what do you project your revenue is going to be in the next two years? What's your exit strategy? And what founders, really want, yeah, what founders really want to say is, hey, dude, I don't even have this thing done yet. But instead, they come up with really horrible numbers and they fight <laughs> back and forth and nobody believes anybody. It's, uh, it's a strange game sometimes. <laughs> you got to make it up to answer the question. And the question yeah. is really unfair. So what, what's your advice to the, uh, the venture capitalist uh, or, or Moses, the uncle? Um, you know, when, when uh, you know, talking about an MVP, uh, where you ask a question like that, you know you're going to get a, um, what do I say, an unreliable answer. I'll give the advice to Moses, the uncle, first. Go hug your nephew or your niece and say, <laughs> I love you and I'm not investing in the company. And just keep family relations. As far as the venture capitalists go, I just think that the more honest the dialogue can be. You wouldn't believe, Jay, how many VC funds I've seen lead early stage and first time founders on where they haven't even raised the fund yet. They're not even honest saying, listen, I'm trying to line up 10 investments and then we're going to go to general partners. So we're going to go to limited partners and we're going to say, hey, you know, we need to get this money from you so we can close the fund. They basically say to early stage founders, they speak in a way that they think they have the money. So they say, we want to invest in you. And then two months pass, three months pass, six months pass. They haven't raised the fund yet. And that company ends up going out of business. I think that there should be more transparency and honesty on both sides of the table. Yeah, wow. Uh, amen to that. That'd be great. And, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have the kind of baggage that we have now in the entrepreneurial game. So, you know, you've been teaching, you've been, you've been writing. And I, I was reading the list of publications in which you have appeared. And I got a, I got a case of eye strain. So I, I stopped after like 27 of them. Um, you've been writing a lot. You've been, you've been sharing yeah. your experience in Germany and otherwise uh, with the community. Um, and you've been trying, I, I'm, I'm guessing here and asking for you to confirm, um, trying to help the entrepreneurial community, the startups make a better game of it. Um, and that's, that's really important to you. I mean, I know a guy in your you know, position can get involved in these companies and make some money, but, um, but there seems to be an overarching interest in your pattern of activity that suggests you want to see entrepreneurs be a better and make more progress and profit. 
So there's, there's a lot in there. The first thing is I blame your eye strain on the fact that at Esquire Digital, we've got an excellent PR team that gets us in the top publications in the world. So I'll pass <laughs> on your compliments there. The second thing is, yeah, I want to make the system better. I want to make it better for everybody. But, you know, I also am somebody who startups know hands out a lot of tough love, just like I've had a lot of tough love handed back to me. I'll give you an example. And I'm not saying this in any way to make fun of these students. I'm just simply to point something out. So it was, you know, the pandemic was about six months old and we were working on some student projects to actually go out and get funding and do real startups and one student group was determined that they were going to go out and start a co-working space here in Montreal and I said to them okay well we're six months into the startup nobody's working in person right now secondly you've got established startups that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars that are closing down companies like WeWork and Breather so tell me before I judge you, basically, why you think you can have a competitive and comparative advantage in maybe the worst time in the past 100 years to go set up a working space. And they didn't have the answers, but they decided to try to move forward with it. And it kind of boggled my mind. I'm mean, like, yeah, there's sometimes, as they say in China, you know, opportunity can be created out of crisis. But there's other times not to. <laughs> this was one of the times not to. I really don't think that that was the great time to do co-working spaces where people physically co-work. Uh, and I've actually seen co-working spaces. In fact, the one that I was working with in Berlin, the Startup Accelerator, they went out and declared bankruptcy because co-working is a tough business model anytime, especially when, uh, when there's a, a pandemic. So again, the long answer to your short question is, I want both sides of the table, investors and startups to work well with each other. And I'd like startups that have products, whether it's hardware or software, that people can enjoy and can make the world a better place, or at least not make the world a worse place, succeed. And that's why I think I've been you know, reasonably generous in sharing my time and attention and a few decades of experience, because like I'm super close to turning 60, uh, and I think I'd like to do this kind of for the rest of my life. That's great. You know, we've been, uh, we've been studying some of the um, bizarre cases uh, involving national action, not the U.S. so much, but in Europe, uh, against companies, corporations, multinational corporations that engage and support and encourage uh, atrocities and war crimes. And uh, what's interesting is, um, you know, I think there's enough of a, a hubbub about this to suggest that maybe there's a new sort of impact, uh, an impact activity, and thus an impact investment conscience coming into these multinationals. You, know, you can't do that. Somebody is going to sue you and get big bucks from you if you do that. If you, if you, if you encourage, for example, uh, genocide in Sudan or, or in um, you know, uh, Rwanda or anything like that, if we catch you doing that, you're going to pay. And so uh, stockholders don't like that. Mm. Directors lose their jobs. Officers lose their jobs uh, when when that judgment comes down. And there's a, a big case pending in Sweden. Uh, so you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking that part of what you're talking about, the engagement between you, the advisor, and the students, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups, um, maybe we're coming to a time where the impact is important. The conscience, the morality of what they're doing is important. Am I right? So the good news, Jay, is that this generation of really, and like the students I've worked with at these universities, Ivy League schools, right, are super elite. They come from all over the world. They've got this social responsibility thing down. Trust me, they're usually coming at this with very, very good hearts. But I'll tell you the piece that I fear. A lot of them think that if you just go out there and do good, you're going to change the world. And I tell them going out there and doing good without a business model, <laughs> isn't going to work. If your idea is you're going to start a nonprofit and you're going to have your hand in everybody's pockets, you're not going to get a lot of impact that way. So yes, there are more impact funds. There are more companies who are thinking in a socially responsible way. But I got to also argue the counterpoint. Why are we having the Beijing Olympics in 54 days in a country that's committing an internal genocide? The U.S. yesterday says they're going to do it. They're going to do a diplomatic boycott, which is pointless. Either boycott the Olympics or don't. So. I think that while we see a lot of positive things, we also see a lot of governments and a lot of very big companies still beholden to the dollar. Yes, we, we haven't really left that station yet. No. Um, the, the other thing uh, I wanted to ask you is, is about um, 
you know, worldliness. You're talking about students, you're talking about young startups, you're talking about people who deal with their uncles. Um, you know, sometimes they're just not worldly. At the same time, if you want to do an MVP or an IVP and pitch, and not only pitch, but really think it through, think how your product is going to work in today's world, you have to be somewhat worldly. And, you know, the question is whether this generation we're talking about, the generation maybe with the new conscience, understands worldly things, they understand how things are working, how things are working in COVID, how things are working around the corner so they can predict if their product will work in, not only in this time right now today, but in the time that you can foresee. So I, I think there's two points to that. The first is I agree absolutely, right? I mean, I've worked with students who have homes in, you know, uh, the Middle East and Paris and London and Montreal and New York. They're extremely worldly. They travel from place to place. They're fluent in multiple languages. Um, you know, I've traveled close to 4 million miles in my life. I've lived in China. I've lived in Stockholm. I've lived in Berlin. I've lived in a lot of these places. I speak multiple languages myself. I get that piece of it. However... I think that in the United States, the greatest places to do startups and to become successful and get the right things that you need from funding to advisory support are amazing places like Buffalo and Cleveland, Pittsburgh. That old kind of Rust Belt has such strong startup communities. I think that a kid from Buffalo is much better off staying in Buffalo than going to Silicon Valley. I tell them this every single week, stay in Buffalo. The community will support you if you have a good idea. They'll get you your initial funding and they will help you test your thesis. Stay there and get it done. This idea 10 years ago that, you know, everybody from the whole world, the best and the brightest, are all going to congregate in Menlo Park, doesn't make any sense. That includes Hawaii. If you can talk about Buffalo, we can talk about Honolulu, can't we? Sure, absolutely. Why not? Stay in Honolulu. Stay in Charlotte. Stay in, you know, Reno. Stay in these places where there is, as Brad Feld wrote a decade ago, that startup ecosystem. The startup ecosystem will help you succeed. And even if you fail once, twice, or three times in your startups, if you give back to that community, when you have that idea, that's going to take off. They're going to help get you there. One of my favorite startups is a Buffalo startup called ACV Auctions. They've done an IPO. They're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They were done by a bunch of local Buffalo entrepreneurs that decided that they had a great way to do car auctions. They've been very successful. And without their connections to the local funding system, to the universities, it wouldn't have got off the ground the way it did. And now it's internationally known. Go to those local startup communities, no matter where you are, and build there. If you need to, you'll eventually get to Silicon Valley. It will take care of itself. Don't start well, there. It's more possible now with Zoom and uh, all the telecommunications and sure. the internet. You can you can be anywhere and connect with everywhere. Um, I wanted to ask you also about, um, you know, the, the state the state of the state, the state of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, I get that, um, you know, you can have brilliant guys developing brilliant products anywhere in the world, but the U.S. has an edge for some reason. It has a culture uh, that allows, um, you know, better entrepreneurial environment for startups. And uh, two questions about that. One, am I right? Two is... Um, What's the state of it now? Is it um, changing? Uh, you know, when, when you come around and talk about IVP, you're adding an idea to the whole entrepreneurial, you know, process. Um, is that kind of thing happening where we are in the culture of startups and entrepreneurial activity? We're refining our thinking. We're improving our thinking. We're improving our chances. And what you're doing is, is that what you're trying to do to improve the chances of every entrepreneur you have contact with? I try to. So the second part of the question first is that startups have become an academic thing. You know, even a decade ago, there were people who thought you couldn't teach entrepreneurship, but we know that we can teach entrepreneurship. When we arm students with the right amount of knowledge and the right kind of knowledge, it helps increase their chances of success in running a startup, which is still, of course, remarkably low. That's number one. The second part of the question is about this kind of American ethos. So there's something unique about being American no matter what. So this idea of that kind of Silicon Valley startup work ethic, the idea that you're going to succeed no matter what, that's all great. I'm seeing it in other parts of the world as well. You know, there have been some very big startups that have come out of Sweden. And there have been some startups that have done very well in Europe that we might not have heard of in North America that have come out of Sweden. But there's one thing the United States doesn't have, 
that these other countries like Canada and Sweden and Germany do have. And that's the proper government funding for these early stage startups. Now, you can make an argument, as I have many times in the past, that a lot of this government funding in the grant form just kind of keeps startups alive longer than they should be. But there are also startups who stay alive and turn the corner at the last minute and become very successful because of government funding that just doesn't exist in the United States. Hmm. We should do something about that. We have to stay. We have to stay ahead. I mean, to the extent that we're ahead now, good, but we have to stay ahead because everybody's going to try to emulate us about these very things, no? Yeah, but that's not good. In my opinion, at least as somebody who watches politics pretty closely, that won't happen in the next, let's say, six years, because I think that, you know, no matter what your politics are, the reality is there's going to be, I think, a little bit of a red wave during the midterm elections and maybe 2024 as well. And public opinion has turned against a lot of the big tech companies and the Republicans are gonna get a lot of leverage out of that. So making things friendlier for startups and friendlier for tech companies isn't in the immediate future for the United States. Huh. You, you anticipated my next question, the whole Zuckerberg thing. You know, Zuckerberg arguably isn't interested in um, making the world a better place. He's interested in improving his own profit position. Uh, and but, but it has, what he's doing has enormous effect on the world um, by the billions of his, of, of his followers, members, you know. Um, and so the question is, uh, I mean, is, is government doing what it has to do? Should government be doing more? And I suppose the, 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 the secondary question to that is the relationship between the startup industry in, in the U.S. and lawyers. Sorry, sorry I said that. Lawyers in general. Are we over-legalizing things? Uh, are we, you know, the, going back to the case of that uh, German cell of programmers who lost it because they couldn't deal with the legal manipulations of, of, uh, of Google, um, the U.S. has a tremendous culture of lawyering, uh, especially around startups. There's a lot of money in it. So uh, uh, have we messed ourselves up that way? Well, we're never going to get away from that, right? I mean, I comment a lot on a lot of these big cases like the Tinder case that's going on right now, the Apple versus Epic appeal. That's just the reality. That's the lay of the land. The lawyers aren't going to go away. I agree that we've made entrepreneurship and the startup world much more complicated than it needs to be. But I don't think that more government intervention is necessarily the way to go. I'm also not saying that, you know, it should be a total laissez-faire startup economy where people can get away with whatever they should get away with. Startups were supposed to do no harm. <laughs> that's worked out that way. I uh, mean, Google, Google was supposed to do no evil, remember yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, it, it, but it hasn't worked out that way. So is the correct antidote that, you know, partisan government infighting over which startups we should focus on. Look, the reality is there's a lot of people who don't like the persona that Mark Zuckerberg has developed as a person. And as a result, they don't like the company. And as a result, there's more legal and governmental involvement in that company. I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. You know, if you don't like Facebook, there's something very simple that you can do. You can delete the app, right? Absolutely. And some people are. But, yeah. but I, I don't, you know, I think most people don't even get to this conversation because they stand there on the street corner with the phone and they spend the whole day, you know, having gratification on Facebook. Uh, what can we do about that? Not a lot. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you one last question because we're kind of out of time. Um, and that is, uh, how can I read more about what you're thinking and doing going forward? Uh, I, I know I could probably, if I Google you, I'll probably get you know, 27 pages of material, but where's the best place to study this, to study what you're doing with Esquire and the other, all the academic organizations you're involved in? So we actually have our own online newspaper, todaysesquire.com. That's certainly a good place to start. And then, yeah, if you Google Aaron Solomon, it's funny, you know, I had this conversation with a professor years ago who was saying that, you know, it, it, nobody should be on the internet. And I said, when it comes to the startup world, if you you can't Google somebody and get a pretty good sense of who they are and who their what their persona is, then I think you should probably not trust them. If you Google Aaron Solomon, you're going to find mostly me with one A and you're going to find like at least 27 pages of stuff. <laughs> uh, Aaron Solomon, Esquire Digital. So great to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, Thanks, I, see, I see you as a leader in a very important process that is increasingly important as we go forward.
You're far too kind. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Eric. Aloha. Thank you.